Hi, I'm Dr. Marvin Natovich. I'm a medical geneticist and researcher at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm really pleased today to have for this continuing medical education session a discussion with Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal behavior at Colorado State University, and she's going to talk with us today about experiences of persons with autism spectrum disorders in the medical system and how to improve the types of encounters that persons with autism have with clinicians. Because this is a continuing medical education session, there are two major learning objectives for today's session. The first is to uh, provide some first-hand insights about how persons with autism spectrum disorder experience medical treatment and how that may differ from the experiences of neurotypical individuals. And second, to describe some communication strategies and other supports that may be helpful to some individuals with autism when they're in clinical settings. So to begin with, thank you very much for being here today, Dr. Grandin. Thank you. Can you tell us what type of work you're doing? Well, I'm a professor of animal science. I do work in animal behavior. I did one of the first studies that show that uh, cattle that get frightened during handling for veterinary procedures uh, gain less weight. And getting uh, scared during medical procedures is a major problem. I'll tell you what my doctor did when I was maybe four and it was really bad. He said, look out the window at the bird feeder and then he stuck a shot at me and I hit the ceiling. That's not the way to do it. I see. So uh, it sounds like you feel that uh, children or adults with forms of autism should be prepared prior to their encounter with the medical system. The other big problem is uh, sensory sensitivity. Uh, I remember one time I had to do that glaucoma test where they put the lens against the eye and I couldn't tolerate having that thing put on my eye because of touch sensitivity. And then I was in a research study where they used one of those same kind of lenses and they patched my eye because they wanted me to not be, you know, seeing for half an hour. And then the pressure from the patch made it so they could put that thing into my eye without any, any problem at all. But touch sensitivity, that's a really big problem. Another thing is sound sensitivity. My dentist now uh, does the ultrasonic cleaning at half power and is still able to get the teeth cleaned, uh, but then they, but the highest power on that ultrasonic uh, cleaner just drives me absolutely crazy. So it's sound sensitivity and touch sensitivity. Okay. Um, one of the things that you're very famous for is your ability to design facilities for humane uh, uh, treatment of animals in different situations. Um, when you use your abilities in design or engineering, uh, how would you apply them to, say, pediatricians' offices or internists' offices to make the clinical encounter um, less uh, difficult for someone with autism who has sensory challenges? Well, let's get the noise cut down. Some mobile phones have a high-pitched ring. High-pitched sounds tend to be the worst. Uh, some individual has visual um, processing problems, so a checkerboard floor would be really bad because they'd see it shimmering. Um, but basically, I uh, cut noise down, uh, having a quiet place to be. A lot of medical offices now, they kind of do the southwestern thing, you know, you know light, uh, uh, light uh, tan paneling and some pastels. That's probably good. But then also have some of the kids' favorite toys there in the waiting room would be a good idea. And um, outside of medical offices, there's um, emergency room encounters. Do you have ideas about how uh, emergency rooms or emergency departments might be structured uh, differently or might reduce certain types of sensory input? Or, so First thing, we've got to deal with the surprise factor. A lot of kids on the spectrum like tech stuff. You know, let them find out how some of those machines that they have there actually work. Because I find that's really interesting. Now, that's not going to work with a five-year-old, but with a slightly older child, get those machines to go from being scary to being something cool. I see that's really interesting. Okay. And um, the physical layout, is there anything that you would recommend in terms of physical layouts that would work better in emergency rooms from your experience? I just want to get the noise down. 
Okay. I remember one time going to the intensive care ward at the veterinary hospital. Now, and there was a dog and there were some cats there in intensive care. And I go, wait a minute, they're being bombarded with noise. And it's bad enough for normal people. All this beeping and all this noise, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's really, really stressful. And what about blood draws, either in the office or in the emergency department, or any suggestions you have to make that part of the encounter uh, less difficult? Well, I don't like blood draws. I still don't like them. The surprise factor is really bad. And the other thing is that's a real unpleasant procedure. Um, I think a really good idea would be to, um, uh, again, no surprises, maybe have some kind of reward after you do that. Now you take things like scanning, that's like cool. You can get a CD or you can get a memory stick with a picture of your brain on it. That's like very cool. In fact, um, in University of Pittsburgh, they have a practice scanner. It's not, that looks just like the real one. It makes all the same noises. But some things like these scanning machines, uh, those can be made cool because then you can have this cool picture. You can put it on your phone, you can show it at show and tell. You know, try to get some of the interest factor up. And are there things that you would recommend to parents of children to prepare their children before they come to a clinic visit? All right, what kind of a visit? Let's be specific. Dentist, well, uh, a doctor's checkup, what, what is it going to be? Let's do each of them. All right. Uh, maybe come in and just look around on the first visit and then have them come in and watch somebody else get the same procedure. And so you've mentioned dentists. What about a regular medical office visit? What well, maybe a video beforehand, before they go so they know what's going to happen. Again, making it go from scary to cool. Uh, the more they can learn about it, the better, mm -hmm. because surprises scare. That, that's helpful. And what types of things do you, would you want the healthcare professional, whether it's a dentist, a nurse, or a doc, to know about autism? They need to be aware of the sensory sensitivity, but the doctor needs to be aware that there are real sensory problems. The other thing is they're very variable. Sound sensitivity problems vary, very, very severe to very mild. Uh, some individuals have problems with uh, visual image uh, pixelating because the circuits that assemble the graphics file are damaged in the back of the head. It's just knowing that these things, things can happen and that the person's not trying to just be uncooperative. Okay, those are very doable. Those are sure. totally doable. If the world were perfect and you could have significant input into the training of physicians, um, what types of things or experiences would you include in their medical school training to help them become better in working with persons with autism? Let's give doctors some hints on how you can sometimes desensitize little kids. If it's an auditory stimulus, let the child control it. You know, okay, let's say you're drilling at the dentist and the kid goes like this, the dentist better stop. You see, you give the child a, an element of control also helps. One time I had a psychiatrist say to me, I don't understand these sensory problems. And I said, just imagine I took a speaker put on super loud and I just stuffed it in your ear. Now just imagine if normal sounds were that loud. It's like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. It hurts. It also sets off a fear reaction. And the scientific research has shown that when you look at um, functional MRIs, in certain individuals with autism, certain sensory stimuli set off the amygdala, which is the fear center. That's not a normal response. It's like overwired. And you're also well known for doing a lot of research. Um, what in your mind are some of the foremost research questions that need to be grappled with? We need to be working on sensory issues. You see, you get a, give a kid an autism label, the sensory issues range from mild to very, very severe. Some kids have hearing sensitivity. Others, it's um, visual sensitivity. Others have food taste aversion. These sensory issues are very variable. So if we're gonna do research on it, you can't just uh, assign the subjects to control in experimental groups by an autism label. You've got to pick out exactly which sensory problem they have and put them against controls that don't have that sensory problem. And we need to be working on treatments. I think there's certain things in little kids Little kid doesn't want to be hugged, that's the easy one to desensitize. Just remember, firm pressure's calming, tickle touches are alerting. So we work on desensitizing them. Some of these sensory issues can be desensitized, especially in small kids. 
and we need to work on effective methods for doing this and do research on this is my top priority in autism research. Because how can a kid be social if they can't tolerate the noisy restaurant? This is very helpful. Okay, so Dr. Grandin, um, uh, one of the books you're famous for is the book Thinking in Pictures. And you talk about visual learners. Yes. And um, there's a subset of persons, both children and adults with autism, who are visual thinkers, yes. visual learners. Uh, for such persons, how can medical professionals, nurses and docs, use, uh, apply their medicine um, in, in, in to persons who are visual learners to make the clinical encounter a better encounter? Well, if they know what's going to happen. I can remember as a little kid and they did that ether sieve thing they put on my face for a tonsillectomy. Well, the nurse took one little whiff and then she put it on me. It was still really scary when she put it on me, but the fact that she took one little whiff first made it a lot less scary. So you scary. saw a picture of her doing No, she did. It. She put it up just very momentarily. Yeah. She says, look, this doesn't hurt me, but she put it was just very momentary, and then she, you know, sort of a thing that looked like a kitchen strainer mm -hmm. with ether. You see, this was a long time ago. Now I'm showing how old I am. They have my tonsils taken out at age six with ether. So it was both uh, a, a visual experience of seeing someone do it and uh, yeah, having it seeing somebody else well. do it, so it's not so scary. Mm -hmm. And it took away the component of surprise as well. You've got to get that surprise component out of there. Okay, now they've got they didn't have all the fancy equipment. You see, then when I woke up for the operation, they don't have any. This is the fifties. It was just a bed in the room. There was another kid in there. He took a card and kept running it across the bars on the bed, which was really noisy. Um, yeah, but now you have all this equipment. I think having to watch videos and, and uh, watching other people do s stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, something as simple as the dog can put the stethoscope on himself first to show that that's not going to hurt him. Let the kid try the stethoscope. You want to try to get kind of interest thing in it so it isn't, maybe it's interesting rather than scary. You see, people with autism, some of them, it's hard for them to get the words out doctor does or the nurse does not give the person time to respond. Sometimes it takes longer to access the memory files and make a response. There's also been some real messes with them. the police uh, pull their driver over and they don't know how to respond. And I want to make, I want to get these kids driving and I suggest they rehearse that. Or you just have a, have a friend pretend they're the policeman and you just rehearse it, how to do it. No, you don't want to have a policeman pull you over. But sooner or later it's going to happen. So you better know exactly how to behave. Uh, maybe uh, have them watch stuff in the emergency room so that they know what's going to happen. And the other thing is, you have to explain to them, it's an emergency. I mean, let's say you've got, we're bleeding. They have to just do it. They don't have time to explain. They've got to do it and do it now because you're going to die if they don't uh, work on you like now. So the more kind of real factual kind of shows and stuff they could watch about how ER works, and that sometimes they're going to have to just do stuff on you because it's called an emergency room for a reason. If you're seriously hurt, they've got to uh, just start working on you. They're not going to have time to talk. But if you know that up front, then you go, okay, I'll let the doctors just work on me. Yeah. And not uncommonly, as hard as uh, clinical professionals trial, uh, sometimes things get behind schedule and a person um, with autism may uh, be seen later on this, uh, than was anticipated. What are some strategies that you recommend parents of children employ? They gotta learn. Or and they gotta learn in many different activities. Sometimes you have to wait. If there's a thunderstorm at the airport, I have to wait. That's just the way it is. But on the other hand, I always allow plenty of time to get to the airport. So if they have an accident or something out on the interstate. I'm not rushing through at the last minute. So the people that are taking them to the doctor's appointment, let's get them there early enough. So we're not doing rush, rush there. But they've also got to learn that in life, and they need to be taught this for many different things, things are not always on time. They need to learn that. And are there, how, how are there specific coping strategies? Do you recommend that people walk around the area? Well, for some individuals who might want to walk around the area, maybe this is the time you get the phone out and they're allowed to play a video game in the, in the waiting room mm -hmm. because that's going to calm them down. Now, I think video game playing needs to be controlled, 
because I'm hearing really bad things. He's 21. He's playing video games eight hours a day. I can't get him out of the house. That's and any benefit you can get from a video game you'd get in an hour a day. Um, but different individuals might have different things. Let's say the waiting room's got screaming babies in it. Well, then maybe uh, they need to go outside. Or if it's, or maybe try to schedule a time. Maybe you can't always schedule a time when the babies aren't going to be there. Well, then you just go outside. Walk around outside, and then when it's time for the appointment, come in. It's sort of, you know, they're too often, I think, in a lot of these things, they're trying to overgeneralize. One of the problems I'm seeing today with a lot of younger parents and younger professionals is these individuals have grown up in a world where there's been no hands-on activities in school. No art, no clay, music, woodworking, welding. You've got individuals going into medicine and also going into parenting that have never done hands-on things. And they're not very resourceful about just figuring out ways to solve a problem. Uh, too, too often now, you've got parents that go to school and say, well, just fix them. Well, my mother was extremely resourceful in just finding things in the neighborhood. And there were no autism support groups you know, when I was a child. But you know, she grew up in the Depression. You learned resourcefulness. Like you got a hole in the bottom of your shoe, you fixed it with cardboard and this gunk that they would get, because you couldn't get a new shoe because rubber was rationed during that time. And, and uh, I think one of the worst things the schools have ever done is taking out all the hands-on classes. And one of the reasons those classes are important is they teach sort of ingenuity and resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're saying that also applies to the docs. It applies to doctors, it applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, had, I've said to one parent, your boy needs to learn some work skills. We don't have paper routes anymore. So why don't you have a mom um, walk dogs for some other families in the neighborhood. And the mom says, our school doesn't have a program for that. I said, you don't need a program for that. I'm talking about oh, maybe in your neighborhood or in your apartment building, just talking to some of the other people there and offer your kids services. You don't need a program for that. Sure. And But there's some, uh, like Tito Muckapatahe talks about um, the, uh, you know, body boundary issues. There's a book called, How Can I Talk? If My Lips Don't Move by Tito Macapate, nonverbal, looks really low functioning, and he describes a sensory jumbled world. I strongly recommend that, that doctors that are dealing with um, nonverbal, only partially verbal individuals read that book. And well, this brings up a larger issue that's very interesting and important. What are some resources that you would recommend for those viewers who want to learn more about sensory issues and autism? Uh, what, what types of resources would you feel would be best? Well, I would recommend they read The Autistic Brain. That's my book. Um, if they're dealing with nonverbal individuals, um, Tito Macapata, hey, um, how can I talk if my lips don't move? And there's an old book by Donna Williams called Autism, an Inside-Out Approach. And uh, she has a lot of visual processing problems that I don't have. And that would give some interesting insights. I have found that the greatest insights on sensory issues for me have been other people's uh, describing them. Because some of them have issues I don't have and reading science literature and reading about MRI studies that showed that loud noises were actually turning on the amygdala in the person with autism and that was not happening in the regular person. So a little noise is like nothing to most people is setting off a big fear response. You know, and I got fear responses from that. Well, now there's, there's this science that shows why. And are there any um, film or video-based resources that you feel strongly should be um, recommended as potential uh, resources on this topic? I don't, can't think of any, any right now. I'd recommend those books. Okay. Um, and I haven't seen the curious instance of the dog in the night, but people that have been to it tell me they do a really good sensory overload with strobe lights and lots of loud music and, and I've, I've told people for years that certain loud sounds were a dentist drill hitting a nerve. You can imagine what that would be like, but it was in your ear. And uh, uh, scratchy clothes, I can't stand scratchy clothes. Another problem you might have in the hospital, like some of these paper gowns and things, the scratchiness of it is going to bother some people. Mm -hmm. But there's one piece of equipment a lot of them are going to like, and that's the lead x-ray apron that the dentist uses, that deep, the pressure from that. 
And a lot of uh, people on the spectrum, when they go to the dentist, they have the x-ray put on for the entire time because it helps calm them. I see.